Okay, I think we are beginning here. Evolution Hour, number 99, Troubles in Paradise, The Methodology of Creationism, clickety-clack, old stuff, typewriters, remember typewriters, digital clocks, analog clocks, Troubles in Paradise, The Methodology of Creationism, and old RJ doing his shtick in as clumsy and awkward a way as I can figure out how to do. So, uh, Jackson Wheat will be with us uh, shortly. He was just driving home and I was listening to him <laughs> chit-chatting. Uh, on his just audio. Uh, so, uh, uh, Brian, uh, I see in the live chat, uh, we'll discuss a little bit of those new dinosaurs because he's been following some of this stuff more than I have. So that will be kind of fun. And um, uh, as those of us who have been following me will be boringly aware, I've been going through the Contested Bones book by Rufi and Sanford where they are attempting to show that human evolution is a crime. And the chapters that they've been dealing with, or the chapter they've been dealing with now, is to try to argue that Australopithecines and uh, uh, the like coexisted with human beings, which ain't true. But they've got to do it by parsing the definition of what Homo sapiens are. They've got to drag in Homo habilis and Homo erectus and all of these others to try to basically argue that, that everything that was identified in our genius, genus is just us. And that there ain't anything else in our genus other than us. And then the Australopithecines get shunted over into the ape category, and it's extremely tedious. So I put, as usual, uh, open access material on that uh, in relation to uh, these new finds. And we'll also be discussing a bit about um, uh, Gunter Beckley and his riffing off of the new Philippine stuff. Hi, uh, hi, Travis and Brian and uh, Old Scratch and Lisa for Truth. Hi, Lisa, uh, in the uh, live feed there. Uh, got a couple more Patreons too, which I will be uh, thanking them as well. And Lisa being one of our Patreons, uh, I am uh, Benjamin Simpson. Hello, Benjamin. He's one of our new, uh, Patreons. I am much delighted, happy at everybody that has actually ponied up funds to keep the old RJ running. It makes things rather easier in slogging along each month from, um, somebody that's on social security. Anyway. Uh, before we get to uh, some of the uh, material that's on the agenda, uh, I will mention some of the weirdness that pops up uh, that uh, fits in with the trip tip material. I discovered that an unusual photograph of God was put in an email. And uh, I was really anxious to see a photograph of God. Uh, and so I linked on it from this uh, preserve freedom thing. And what we ended up with very briefly was a, a, a image that was then downloading stuff on bananas and your health. This was the only time, this one minor moment, where you could see the photographical evidence of God's existence, but nothing on it actually in the website. It was a pure product shill thing that was trying to feed off of people. And I was so looking forward to seeing photographic evidence of God. I wanted to know, you know, God taking selfies. I really was looking forward to that. And another one that popped up, uh, that I'll do just in, in passing. Creation.com uh, just yesterday dumped a thing about Leonardo's dragon, where uh, supposedly Leonardo da Vinci painted a little, t uh, uh, drew a little sketch of an actual live dinosaur, uh, which they even specified as probably being uh, this uh, Lemosaurus, uh, Lesamosaurid, that uh, had just been discovered. And uh, they seem to um, avoid a tiny detail that. A, dinosaurs didn't exist by then, and B, why do we assume Leonardo da Vinci had ever seen one? Didn't he paint also dragons? And as it turns out, yeah. And he even described, um, one of the ones that he did was a cute little sketch of a uh, of a dragon slaying a, um, uh, a lion. And uh, at one point, um, as I discovered with Charles Nichols' uh, Leonardo da Vinci book uh, in 2004, um, about how da Vinci approached the problem of painting fanciful creatures. And he said, uh, the, the story is further shored up by some dragon studies at Windsor and a drawing of a dragon flight in the Louvre, both belonging to the 1470s and by a passage in the Trattato, where Leonardo recommends precisely the kind of combinatory technique that we hear of in the Vissarian anecdote. Quote, you cannot fabricate any animal that does not have parts that are recognizable as belonging to other animals. If therefore you wish to make a dragon, take for its head that of a mastiff or a setter, for its eyes those of a cat, etc. 
Lamazo speaks of a painting by Leonardo of a dragon fighting a lion done with such art that no one who looks at it can tell which of them will be the victor uh, and so forth. So all of this has to do with um, the wonderful imagination of Leonardo da Vinci, not that he had actually seen a living dinosaur traipsing around in the 16th century. Oh, dolly gosh, this is a, a, a colossal mistake. And yet creationists are just obsessed with um, uh, these um, cryptozoological things because they want to have dinosaurs existing. And uh, uh, Lisa for Truth says uh, a chimera. Um, yeah, well, the, uh, what's interesting about his dragon is that it is not a hexapodal organism. It has uh, the upper limbs apparently turned into uh, the wings, which would be much more bat-like. Uh, in its characteristic, and then a kind of long um, uh, snake-like neck structure, the kind of oddball front end that's not really matching anything. It doesn't fit reptiles or or anything. It's uh, it, it, But that kind of a snout is what he seems to be fond of for uh, dragons. Uh, it's a little bit like the same lore that the Chinese would have in this kind of vertebrish-ish thing. And and seemingly there's possibly, depending on how accurate you want to regard the, the picture, uh, genitalia, uh, mammalian genitalia on, on the dragon, which is an interesting phenomenon for a dinosaur, which uh, wasn't a mammal. Uh, so um, uh, where, there we go on these sorts of things. No, it was a, a fascinating chimera. And of course you have unicorns and a lot of other things. They were, they were just starting to discover foreign animals. The Romans would depict animals, of course, uh, in varying ways. And some of the cryptozoology pictures show up uh, from a Roman mosaics where they would have something or other that looks sort of like uh, a dinosaur if you view from a distance. What the hell the painter was had up their sleeve? Who knows? They're, it's about other stuff. So they're just filling in material. Same thing with that um, stegosaur supposedly on a uh, Cambodian temple that pops up, but they're really grasping at straws. The, the simple fact of the matter is there's absolutely no evidence that any of these critters ever survived down to modern times. So forget it. Uh, and people can make up shit. So, um, oh, uh, Lisa for truth, unicorn is a rhino. Uh, yeah, although to the creationists have found a variety of, um, um, I think a bovid uh, that has a, um, a single horn-like uh, element as well up in Siberia that's like 100,000 years earlier uh, that they've decided is actually the unicorn. So it's just they, they, they trawl around to find critters that nobody in the Bible would have known about <laughs> in order to justify that because the logic of inerrancy means that everything in the Bible has to be true. And so if it mentions unicorns or, or uh, uh, Leviathan or Behemoth, it's got to refer to something real. And they can't just accept that some of it is exaggeration and secondary accounting, although I'm very fond of the idea that Behemoth was a hippopotamus. It fits very, very nicely. Um, anyway, um, uh, Brian Stevens says, well, dragons can appear as people, so it's natural for them to have human genitals. Ah, yes, you see, that is a new science of dragonology that we are working on here. And of course, that documentary Game of Thrones showed many dragons in vivid color, so it must be real. Anyway. <laughs> um, so back on to stupid contested bones. Um, oh, insect says uh, uh, Brian, uh, it was supposed to be on Mel's stream last week that got canceled. I'm going to be on her channel tomorrow. I hope there's a good discussion on a discussed uh, um, in, uh, insects. Oh, intellectual iconoclasm brings up, are you aware of the postulation that the griffin is just a protoceratops with a shattered crest? Uh, yeah, that comes from Adrian Mayer. And uh, alas, I think Brian Switek uh, did a um, an analysis fairly recently where he poured cold water on her argument that uh, she was being a little bit selective in what texts and depictions of griffins. Uh, and although it sounds like a really nice argument, I was very impressed by it. it when you looked at it in grim detail, it turned out not quite to be as impressive as uh, it looked at first glance. So uh, alas, it's probably unlikely that the, the Griffin legend uh, and Griffin depictions were really directly drawn on, although the, the, the um, uh, Protoceratopsid fossils that might have been weathering out uh, uh, in Mongolia. It's not impossible to imagine. I mean, Switek says you, that, that all sorts of things might have connected up on things, but the notion that it was a, that, that the classic, ah, oh, Jackson's here, the classic Griffin was directly related specifically to that fossil rather than being largely a chimerical animal um, is a strained one. 
Sorry. Oh, well, it was I, I was fond of it, too. And I'm a great admirer of, of Meyer's work in general on bringing up how fossils were perceived in the ancient world. But this one, may, she may have pressed a tad too far. OK, um, well, we should probably do a little cute discussion here. of Some of those new tyrannosaurs and dinosaurs and stuff, because you seem to be more aware of them than I am. Brian and others were talking about it in the live feed. And so we, we might as well be horribly topical uh, before moving on to uh, the, the main agenda. <laughs> Yes, new theropods. Woo! Yeah. Uh, a new tyrannosaur discovered recently, one of the early small-bodied tyrannosaurs called Suska tyrannus. And uh, then there was also a member of the group Scansoriopterygidae, which is always fun to say. Uh, that guy was called, uh, I think, Ambotarix was, I think, his name. Uh, a few years back, I think it was back in 2015, they found the first theropod with like bat-like wings instead of you know, feathered wings like a like the birds. Although these guys do also have feathers. Yi Ki was the one discovered in 2015. Yeah. Yeah, they're a group that's just screaming at how much diversity was going on in these theropods that we didn't know about because they weren't showing up in lager state in context where we could see what was on their little bodies. Yeah, exactly. And so now we found another one. So there were probably a whole bunch of little bat theropods flying around or gliding it's around. Fun to work out and actually does connect up with the whole issue of what do you make based on limited information that bears directly upon Gunter Beckley's posting and the stuff that's dealing with uh, Homo habilis in uh, Rupi and Sanford. See, I try to connect all the pieces together, uh, <laughs> which relates to what do you do as new information comes along? that suggests that your general view of the information you have might not be as detailed as it needs to be. And one of the, the overall trends over the last 40 years, long before you came along, is Ooh. the abandoning of the um, uh, single species view, uh, the sympatric evolutionary model for vertebrates. And we get more and more into an allopatric model where you have breeding populations spreading out and fissioning off and coalescing in hybrids and moving into a lot of little areas. And um, that that's probably what was going on in hominids. And it's probably what was going on in dinosaurs and in a whole bunch of other ones that you just can't see because you have a scatter shot of data blips where you have teeth. Uh, that have been preserved well or a fragment of something or other and you don't know what the whole body was attached to it and until you can get those larger fields you can't see all of the population shifts that are going along in uh, an allopatric modality uh, conceptually once you gear shift into that suddenly you're not having panic attacks uh, when each of these new fossil data can, comes along but the intelligent designers and the, and the uh, creationists love the little ambiguities so they'll pounce on these things. Uh, Beckley's piece uh, that I put the link up to, it relates to the new Philippine um, hominids that were just found. Uh, and remember, they only found like a couple of finger bones and some teeth. And so there's not a hell of a lot going on there. They don't have the whole bloody body. But Gunter Beckley, who is the, the now resident paleontologist, he got religion and has turned into the Casey Luskin replacement at the Discovery Institute. And he has a new fossil human species thwarts core Darwinian predictions. And he just can't resist overplaying his hand uh, where he brings this up and goes on not inaccurately. And he doesn't claim they're hoaxes or anything like that. And he's got a few technical papers each side, plus this brand new one that's in nature that I can't put a link to because it's not open access. But anyway, he ends with this astonishing declaration. The neo-Darwinian theory of macroevolution has failed on all fronts from mathematical feasibility to theoretical plausibility and explanatory power to empirical support. Mm, harumph. No, that's not true. And what is consistently missing, and the reason why I put Beckley's posting up, is that Beckley doesn't tell us what he thinks happened. What does he think happens with these critters? He never explains it because there is no intelligent design model. They have an anti-Darwinism model, a not neo-Darwinian, a not natural evolution, a not something they don't want, not what they think happened. What was going on? Was there magical creation of species? Are there lineages going on? What do they think is going on? And at no point has Beckley apparently ever thought about that. And I don't think he ever is. But in that respect, he would be falling completely within the tradition 
of uh, standard anti-evolutionism, which just goes on and on. Uh, I did put a link, however, to the Nature Commentary uh, by uh, uh, Tocharai, uh, Matthew Tocharai, who is, uh, I'm, or Tocharai, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, uh, who is a, a paleoanthropologist, and he's done quite a few papers and things. I've got many of my references. Uh, anyway, he did the commentary on these new points, and they have illustrations of what was actually found and a discussion of the issues about how are they relating to Homo erectus and that they don't have, they couldn't extract DNA from it, so uh, or at least haven't yet. So that that isn't telling us. So it's it's a, it's a thing that goes. Ooh, interesting thing. Let's see what the follow up is, and can they find more f remains to get more information? It looked like that there were aspects of what was found that's more consistent with it being not a standard species we're familiar with. The teeth are kind of humanish, but small, and the um, uh, hand of bones are more consistent with a uh, more standard hominid style, not human one. So what, what, how does that fit together in a whole critter? Well, we've seen from the Leddy and all these others, how much variation goes on in these hominids. And all you need is a slight tweak to some genes to produce an allometric variation, which would be related to their environment and they're relating to their diet for teeth and the, whether or not they're, they're prone to living in trees or climbing a lot to escape predators. Or do you want to climb a tree to escape a predator that climbs trees? All of that connects up with a whole dynamic of uh, circumstance. And it suggests that there's way more going on in uh, the hominid groups up until... Uh, Part of the difficulty with human evolution study is we're the last hominid standing. That by the time we start noticing our background and by the time we write things down and make pictures, um, everybody else is gone. And all we have are weird legends of strange ape men in the forests and um, um, and other things, some of which is probably made up, and others are maybe reflecting interaction with uh, non-human hominids. It's hard to tell what was going on with some of these things. I, I always have, oh, Jane, at least it's asked, uh, 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 are they related to the Javanese erectus? Good question. Maybe. Um, what if they were their own descendant species from erectus, unrelated yeah. to ourselves? And that would not be a, a shocker of a, of a thing, given the Denisovans and the newer DNA that we've gotten from Neanderthals, that we know that there are groups that... that the Denisovans are a prime example that up until fairly recently, we didn't even know they existed. And then they started finding a little example and now they found more and more and gradually they're building up a thing and, they, and they're young enough that we can see their DNA. And uh, then there's still a third group that uh, has been identified no, yeah. that, that doesn't seem to be from either Neanderthals or Denisovans. So there's a, another bunch out there. But unless you had DNA floating around like clouds in, and, and, and then latching on to people like ghostly things coming down their thing like a science fiction movie. No, there were animals. There were, there were hominids going on that we don't yet know about because we don't have that availability. The interesting thing about all these in the Asian area is that some of them are found in context. The Philippines, how did they get there? That even with the ice ages dropping the sea level down, you still got water to cross them. And that was the, that's one of the puzzlements of Flores, that there's still a certain amount of distance to get across water. Uh, and so how much of this was accidental? Or do people figure out how to paddle a, a log way earlier than we thought? These are all absolutely fascinating issues that the paleontology will gradually work out. And we can guarantee you intelligent designers won't be the ones to do it. <laughs> they rode elephants across. Yes, yes. They, uh, or or they, they, they just strode across water in, in a miraculous event that uh, is not, <laughs> or maybe an extremely slow pyroclastic flow that was extremely cool that they managed to, <laughs> or, or Kent Hovind's, um, uh, uh, or the, I can't remember, I don't think it was Kent Hovind or some other creationist, the ballistic koalas that were being thrown by the volcano. Oh, Conservapedia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's how they did Lafley it. or whatever his name is. Yeah, Korag says uh, a Nephilim free. Oh, Nephilim free. Nephilim free believes Neanderthals existed post flood. So, does that mean that they were in cages on the ark as animals, or does that mean that Noah and his family were Neanderthals? Gosh, that's an interesting prospect. Uh, I don't think they really bothered to include much um, in the um, the ark displays for that. At least, uh, size, size strikes tour didn't show any, but I think. They've included them on the list of the types, of the kinds. Unfortunately, and this is another interesting tidbit, why don't we have that list that is in the Ark Encounter 
available on the ARC Encounter website and at AIG so everybody can see it and then see the documentation for it? Is it because they're really not terribly proud of it and they don't want people to notice it too much and they don't want people to think how they came up with the names and, and which ones they put on and which ones they didn't? Because all I have is a blurry photograph that they do have at their website that you can count the number of listings, but you can't read anything below the, the larger captions. It's just too blurry. And I've tried magnifying it and everything. So if anybody uh, within eye, earshot or eye shot who visits the ARC encounter, who can do a high resolution photograph of their damn chart, uh, please uh, do so and make it available to everybody. Put it online, email it to me. Uh, I would love to see what the names are. I've got a little spreadsheet I concocted of the things and I've got therapsid one, therapsid two, therapsid three, because they actually list the, the non-mammalian therapsids as one of the extinct groups in which there's a whole bunch of lines listed. And hmm. I'd like to know what's on them. Sounds so, like uh, nested hierarchies. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. That, well, um, as I pointed out in the, uh, the in Psy Strike's uh, hilarious tour, through the ARC encounter, uh, that when they got to those uh, captions for the therapsids there, they, they would frequently refer to them as non-mammalian um, therapsids, uh, and, and that they really didn't call attention to the fact that the reason why they're not yet mammalian is that they're transitional forms. <laughs> 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 and uh, and so the 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 systematics involved in that. That's why I would like to see which ones they put up. We know how little work on the therapsids has been done by the baromenologists, as in almost none. <laughs> That's true. So where are they getting their listings from? Um, some of the stuff you can track down. It's probably likely that they glommed on to Leitner stuff for the birds because the number of bird kinds that are listed, uh, the number they bandied about is really s similar to what was in Leitner. So I suspect that's it. But you'd still want to see the examples. And as we know, plug for coming upcoming book uh, in the rocks were there. We are really diving into the baromenologist, probably more elaborately than anybody else has done previous. And uh, uh, it that... Um, Nothing is more entertaining than finding the primary source information like to, on, of Todd Wood stuff and Kavanaugh's stuff and actually looking up the original technical arguments that they're making in their own publication. When, when uh, we found that snippet from uh, Todd Wood's uh, 2008 book, that was a gold mine. That was all the stuff on the bats. Oh, and yeah. We, yeah, uh, they, this, is, this is juicy stuff. <laughs> I uh, I bumped into something a very very juicy paper just the other day, um, and it was authored by Kurt Wise. The, oh, uh, good. I, I you, you talk about the uh, the floating forests occasionally. This is one of the papers on the floating forests. But oh, what good. blew me away? Had that full text, so that'll be great that we'll be able to pull off that. Um, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, Apple asked, just curious, how many baromenologists are there? And it's like not five. a big bunch. It's about five <laughs> or six. Yeah. Let me see. Uh, uh, Todd Wood and uh, Kavanaugh and Kurt Wise. And I suppose we get to throw in M. Aaron, whoever Aaron is. We don't what know. What about Leitner? And Leitner, I suppose. She, he's, she's hovering around there. Oh, uh, oh gosh. Uh, his name starts with an H. Uh, he does some stuff, um, Highlinger, Highlinger, or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's, there's probably about enough that you could count. You'd need both hands, but that's about it. And uh, by comparison, the systematics literature is substantially larger. And the number of people who do systematic taxonomy are, are certainly enough that you would require many people's hands uh, to be able to count all of them mm -hmm. off. Uh, but the point is, is that you get to read their stuff. Uh, nothing blows to smithereens creationism better than reading the creationist directly and checking their facts, checking their arguments, seeing what sources that they rely upon, seeing what data they're suppressing. Uh, when Todd Wood blithely announces on one of the families of bats that he removes all of the genetic information, he just ignores it right in front of you. <laughs> I mean, wow. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the wise paper, the funny thing about that, was that for it's about plants it's only about paleozoic plants he acknowledges the entire evolutionary sequence of paleozoic plants but says it's not about evolution it's about their 
desiccation resistance post blood. Yeah. He's trying to parse things down oh. to make it man. A uh, wood did the same thing where he was functionally accepting the whole hierarchical structure of stuff that something can be simultaneously um, a, a hominid and a mammal and a vertebrate and so forth and so on uh, without really wanting to come to grips to the fact uh, that in, in the big picture, everything is a monobarum and all life is one gigantic monobarum. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, and just live yeah. with it. How they uh, support the, uh, the water system for that is, I'd love to know because... You know how a bunch of plants out on the ocean are taking salt water and transforming it into fresh water. That's a neat trick. That's a neat, very neat trick. Uh, desiccation factors do relate to leaf shape. Leaf, leaf sure. shape. Sure. Uh, uh, maple leaves and others that the the, the serrations uh, on them, the little craggy parts, are uh, um, a factor of how the leaf is designed to be able to do that. Uh oh, I use the design word. Uh oh, sure. I'm sure. Design. Uh, that um, and so there's a trade-off between the ability of the thing to bring water in versus the ability not to lose it go in the other direction. So if you think about any any part of the, if you want to look at a big picture notion about evolution, an awful lot about evolution turns on membranes, and a membrane that allows something to go in can allow it to go out. And you may not want it to go out. You may not want some stuff to go in. You may want to excrete but not bring in or bring in but not lose. And those dynamics of how systems evolve to minimize the downsides of stuff, even in relation to antibiotic resistance, uh, the chloroquine antibiotic case involved how the ability of the, of the, the cell to not have the medicine come into the danger areas. So to make sure that it holds it off long enough for its degrading system to get rid of the medicine so it can survive. But the problem is that if it does that, it can't bring its nutrients in. So it has to find ways around it to be able to compensate. And that's the reason why the chloroquine thing uh, happens to have, it has an extremely limited genome, but it's got little cassettes that can compensate for, for some of these biochemical factors when they aren't using their pores in to keep the, the damn medicine from coming in. And uh, uh, looked at from that level, it sure looks like natural evolution at every possible level. If you start looking closely, which anti-evolutionists have a tendency not to do, as you and I have both been noticing in our research. <laughs> that is true. Uh, Whitmore gets more and more ridiculous the longer I read his paper or his, his chapter. Uh, Ooh, it, it's just, the junkyard is here. It, it's just it's, <laughs> it makes no sense that a geologist would... Well, geologist, what is his degrees from Loma Linda? Geologist. Linda Loma. <laughs> Geology. Yeah, yeah, Loma, Loma Linda. Um, uh, 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 keep an eye out. I'll put the. I'll mention it in here. Loma Linda University. Da, 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 Linda. I, mean, I got to put a D in there. Um, this is one of the major Seventh Day Adventist uh, universities. And it is still a spot that if you look at people who may be publishing in regular science journals, uh, uh, that they're not writing technically anti-evolution material. Some of the stuff that, um, oh, um, God, Burdick, uh, not Burdick, somebody else was doing in relation to the, the little Peruvian whales and that. You'll spot the Loma Linda University. Ooh, okay. Uh, so even though a lot of uh, Adventists may be shying away from young earth creationism doctrinally these days, um, the, the full-blown um, creationists uh, often will be associated with Loma Linda University. So take a look at that uh, affiliation on there. Um, do, 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 do. There we go. Uh, oh, keep an eye out too on in the uh, live chat and that, see what kind of questions or comments. Um, that, uh, but yeah, he, it's, it's kind of ridiculous how much stuff he misses or messes up. Uh, it's, it's insane. He should never be making these kinds of or a geologist would never make these kinds of mistakes, mistakes that can be corrected after five minutes of Googling. Yeah, well, that, that's one of the things that I've been noticing, um, and you can use this as a scholarly analytical tool, is when somebody, uh, regardless of their credentials, makes a generic statement and they don't offer a reference for it. Uh, this is more glaring in books, but you'll even find it in their technical literature that they'll have footnote, 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 hole, 
footnote, 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 where it's the spot where they're often are making their bolder claims. Kurt Wise has done this, you know, we're going, oh, don't you think you should have had a reference at that point there? Uh, <laughs> and uh, to fill that little hole in. And the fact that they don't is a clue as to what they're trying to shuffle in, um, uh, shipping God through customs without declaring him as um, uh, uh, Christopher. For Hitchens said at one point, well, I'm about midway thing here, so let me put up shameless plug and thank the patrons. Uh, do, 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 do. And again, we've acquired new patrons. So uh, that is all going to be absolutely delightful. And I have to go through RJ searching for the green button to do the screen share application window over to there. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, so theoretically now we should be seeing what's going on down below. Do we? And yep. That's, oh, there we go. Come on. There we go. That should be. There we go. We're sharing now. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank all of TIPS patrons. You got Hendril and Eric and Suris who upgraded to a higher level on there. I just was absolutely delighted in that. That makes me a happier camper. And uh, um, Travis Adams and Keith Hardon and Fino and Brad and Ralph McFadden and Meek Convertney and Pologia. If you don't know about Pologia, where, what cave have you been living in? He's marvelous. And uh, his videos are spectacular. He goes after ham and eggs. Just the tune is uh, alone is worth listening to the show. Um, it's, it's Sur and then our assistant researchers, Dyer and Duranko and James and Kyle and Nana and Benjamin Simpson. Hello, Benjamin New and Sun and Totus Real and our friends, Daniel and Eat and Stephen. Hello, Stephen and Marigale and insects are cool. Hi, insects. And Daniel and Morton, uh, also a new, and uh, Bo and Staggles and Alex uh, Stone and Paul Williams and Zeshi and legacy patrons who were able to help in times past, and that also is appreciated. Uh, Jen and Jody and John and Andrew and Yui and Mona and Everett, and then uh, down to our um, shameless plug area. Uh, uh, behold and partake of Troubles in Paradise methodology of creationism at tortukan.wordpress.com. Add this to your smartphone, although it's not as easy to fiddle with on that, but or your tablet or your PC or whatever. Tell everybody about it. Uh, all the material there that's posted is open access. Use it. Make use of it. Pologia does. Uh, a lot of people make use of this. Uh, I, I put a lot of effort into this. It doesn't do a damn bit of good if you're not using it. And then you can become a patron at patreon.com, and you can donate also at wgofundme.com dcgo. And you can do recurring things uh, in both spots. So that is my shameless plug. And there are our helpers. The um, I'm I'm a new to this biz, uh, and I've oh okay there we are camera back on. Uh, a lot of people build, uh, uh, depend on it. Uh, Aaron Ra gets uh, material from um, that route, and and Robert Carrier uh, shamelessly points out, and rightly so, that he uh, gets income from his patreons. And so uh, it's, a, it's a matter that he goes. So whenever he does lectures, and he did, I think, with his discussion with uh, uh, Cy and other people over the years, he makes a point to point it out. So old RJ can do the same thing. I'm at a much more rudimentary level there, but uh, all of that uh, helps a great deal. And um, uh, so I keep at the work. And uh, Jackson and I are hot on the killer kick butt rocks were their book. This, this, I am really delighted with everything that we have been doing on this thing. It's, it's, I think, a groundbreaker because when you think of how much twaddle the answers books have put out and how little pushback there has been in the anti creationism discussions, whether it's from PZ Myers or anybody else. Uh, that that they may hit upon little snippets, but they're not really diving into it. Whereas our approach, which uh, I had uh, done in the old tip work, which is to take an entire argument and dismantle it completely, in which case they have no fallback. And that's what you and I are doing on these. Uh, we're, we're not just taking little pot shots at little bits and pieces. We're dissolving their entire logic trail. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mentioned Arn Raw. I got to meet him recently. <laughs> Yes, down at the uh, at that uh, at that Dallas, place. yeah, uh, yeah. That was everybody, pretty neat. Uh, um, ed anybody who can play shameless plugger for uh, um, Jackson and I and the work, uh, do so. Um, if you're at uh, conventions or meetings, uh, tell people about uh, um, Evolution Slam Dunk, and uh, uh, tell them that uh, on the way will be uh, the rocks were there. Uh, that's the killer thing that we're um, uh, making source methods right up in front 
um, center stage in a way that it needs to be. And everybody can see by what we do in our work on video and on postings and in the books, uh, how it works. It's follow the sources, damn it. You learn about what the material is. You may not need to investigate everything, but uh, we are confident that if you look at any of our source arguments and you look up the original material yourself, you will discover that we're not misrepresenting things. We're being fair and rigorous with everything. Oh, uh, Insects says that, uh, that uh, Jackson, uh, we, uh, I'll try to go to faithless form next year. It's only one state over. Um, yeah, there's uh, stuff that's, uh, in some respects, is kind of boring uh, here in, in cute little Spokane. Uh, there was going to be a creationist gathering uh, of uh, Pacific Northwest creationists uh, last October, but it never materialized. Darn, I was going to go there and take a look at it and, and uh, get some enfilades and stuff going. Um, one approach is to make life miserable for creationists in every possible venue not by shouting at them, but by source methods, methodsing them to death, that um, you'll find that it may be uh, driving them to ground to where you will debate with them and they'll never come back because they know you do source methods and they can't. And uh, we'll, we'll, we've been starting to see a little bit of this going on. Uh, I, I'd be delighted if I can ever have a, a, a round two with, with Mark Huffman or uh, uh, standing for truth, or whatever, or uh, Kent Hovind. And um, uh, you, you are supposedly going to be maybe having a, a, a round two with standing for uh, source methods. I will be delighted to see that if it happens. Yep. We'll but, see. We'll certainly see. Not. Because a I lot haven't... of people will say they're OK with having a discussion, but not in practice. And standing has fled like a, a rabbit from any discussion of source methods of what how he builds his argument whether he fact checks any of his stuff and he's avoided it in all the discussions on the videos that i've seen him do i i uh, was i emailed kevin conover uh, bill ludlow is doing all, or did a whole series debunking his non his creation nonsense um and uh conover actually seemed interested to have a discussion with me i emailed him i said hey would you want to come on my channel and talk about evolution and stuff like that and he goes Oh, sure. Sounds great. Uh, any topics in particular? And I said, sure. How about transitional fossils and how they relate to evolution, paleogenomics and developmental biology? And he said, let me send you to my secretary. <laughs> yeah. Never to look up again. what those words mean. <laughs> yep, never heard from him again. So I, I tried yeah. emailing like a few weeks later, but I got nothing. So there is no excuse for superficial ignorance on these matters in 2019. And so there have been quite a few debates that I have seen with Standing for Truth going against um, atheists and, and pro-evolution people where they're just not up on their game. They're uh, coming at without any understanding of what uh, the argument that the creationists have been made and let alone the data field. Whereas we know by our own experience that if you are up on that field, if you know their argument better than they do and you know the science data, that they don't deal with. You can now target your responses to their direct presentation. You're not playing catch up. And, and in a social media context, if you're waiting around, well, I'm going to have some really important things to say about that in a week, uh, you are in a bad position. You need to be able to marshal that material right off the bat. Even if you don't have the link instantly available, you'll say, I'm going to be putting that in, in the comments on the link. And you'll be able to do that, boom, right off the bat. So that they, you're, you're real time responding. And that's the whole bit behind what we're trying to do, what you've been doing in your material, what Paul Logia uh, does on his videos. Um, you all independently stumbled into source methods. I'm trying to kind of goose it up to make it the standard. It's the universal toolkit <laughs> and it's fun too. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Is there any more, is any hunter going out, you know, to, to borrow Elmer Fudd there, I'm hunting rabbits. <laughs> uh, is there any more exhilaration as great in a hunter finding their targeted poor little deer than tracking down a creationist citing an old source that turns out not to say what they said it did and that they misread it? Yeah, that's, uh, oh, that's exactly what happened recently with one of the Whitmore papers. He says he and Austin came up with, they came up with the lake spillover hypothesis 
for uh, the Grand Canyon, wow. which they claim, which they said they came up with it, and then somebody at the Geological Society independently came up with it and didn't give them any credit. But you have to remember, the lake spillover hypothesis is about a lake in Arizona spill over, you know, overflowing and uh, spilling out and carving out the Grand Canyon over millions of years. The Austin and Whitmore think a global flood carved out the Grand Canyon. Oh, no, well, it made, 4, it, years ago. It laid down the sediments. The, the model is even more hilarious because the, the, the flood lays the sediments down, the upper layers of the canyon. All the Precambrian stuff is supposedly pre-flood in their current models. And then a lake of, of leftover dampness from the flood is upstream. And like the Missoula flooding that produced the coolies, that that then bursts and floods in a mini catastrophe that actually right. the canyon in the rock that had only a year to form into rock. Right. <laughs> which they have never, not Austin, not Snelling, nobody in the creationist community has ever offered a technical argument for how the hell that's supposed to happen. That and he way. doesn't. Um, the, he doesn't do it in this one either. He talks about laminations like varves and uh Pyro uh, yeah. and uh, uh, igneous laminations, which were which formed at uh, Mount St. Helens, but he doesn't, oh, yeah. but that's it, that's all he talks about. He doesn't mention uh, any other types of layers at all. It doesn't talk about sandstone, he doesn't talk about limestone, none of those, just yeah, little of laminations in the Grand Canyon is they show an enormous range of depositional frames. Absolutely. Some of them are in the, 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 the region was arid, and so they're aeolian windblown deposits. In other cases, they're tidal estuaries because the shifting continents and stuff has moved all over the place. And so there's echo, echo paleogeographical uh, uh, frames, uh, layer on layer on layer on layer on layer. And if you read the actual technical literature, which I would recommend creationists do now and then, uh, that um, you discover just how immensely detailed the geology has gotten. Uh, and it's, uh, as I'm sure you're, you're discovering in the chapter that you're writing on geology now, you know, boy, it's a vivid and vital and fascinating field. Oh my gosh, I have to read. There was one paper I read I had to read like three times to figure out what the heck it was talking about. Cause geology is not my field. That's not my, my area, my cup of tea. And so it's very interesting. And I like, I like geology cause I like uh, paleontology. And so geology ties of course into that, but it's, there are a lot of terms. I'm used yeah, to biology okay. terms and paleontology yeah. terms, not geology terms. <laughs> and they're, they're ones where there are very similar words or terminology. And literally the difference between one tiny term and another tiny term can mean a huge difference in the way the rock formed. And, you know, it's, so it's, it's, it's beyond just the secret handshake things. It's very critical in the same way that if you're reading law papers or if you're reading in any other discipline or just put it into like car mechanics context, you know, that if somebody were thinking that, that a, a fuel injection and carburetor are the same thing because they involve the way the air comes into the thing, you go, what? Uh, and so everybody has their technical discipline. Um, in, in geology and uh, in any area of the same way if you're dealing with brain research, my heavens, you know, the amount of little subsections of subsections of subsections on there uh, oh, yeah. are, are staggering. Uh, but you get used to it. It's not magic. And so you can find ways that wh whatever it is, you can Google it. You can find out material. You can get descriptions sure. on it. And gradually, you begin to get the feel. Of I actually what, watched uh, a YouTube video about one of them about how... Uh, a type of sediment is deposited on like this, on like a, there's like a beach and you've got kind of this coastal shelf. And it was talking about how this type of sediment is laid down and causes it to not be so, uh, so sloped. It's more, it's more like gradual and how that builds up. I, there's actually a YouTube video I watched about it, which kind of helped solidify in my mind what it was talking about. Yeah, and that and that's where public educators can be fabulous. There, there's a, a, a local area geologist who does just gobsmackingly good videos on the Columbia basalt and the um, uh, Missoula floodings and things. And he he has a, a, a good, easygoing manner, and they pick just the right visuals to show what it means. And he's describing things in very clear cut ways. Uh, educators of that caliber are just worth their weight in gold. And what you like to do 
is to find ones who will be those avenues. Uh, you could spend 24 seven watching videos or reading articles. There's not enough time to do that. I know that my own personal experience. So you have to triage to find the really useful things to be able to home in on the things that, oh, now that is, I'll take 10 minutes to watch that because that's going to clarify what it is because this is from a, a really good explainer and has the good points. And then, and ideally um, we want to urge and, and join the campaign folks watching the show. Uh, any videos that you see on science subjects or for that matter, creationist subjects, if you're snarking with them, demand sources, links. If they, if they have a thing and they're not offering any source material available for follow-up, well, what the hell did they do this for? That everything should be a way of opening up that avenue to get everybody used to that link to the primary as much as possible and get more and more people involved in it. And you want to get reporters uh, who uh, cover a, a politics to use the same method, that when a politician makes a, a blanket statement, well, what evidence did they use? Where did they have the sources for it? Let's see the sources. Let's look it up. Don't take their word for it. Read it up. And it's the same method. This, this is the universal toolkit. Uh, it's a thing that now we can see in our politically harried times. Failure to do this had consequences. That you had people who had terrible method, who were building up a network of political interactions uh, that have taken over the Republican Party uh, and now have people in government who are making decisions on climate policy and nuclear weapons that have the same bad method as Ken Tovin. This is not good. <laughs> and so it's up to us at the grassroots level to adopt the sound method and to make it the standard procedure everywhere that you can't get elected to dog catcher or a city council or um, a state representative or a congressman or a governor or a president without having to pass through a gauntlet of citizen review to where you have to know what it is you think and be willing to say it openly and offer the evidence that you have for it and how you have vetted and checked to make sure that you're confident with that, that's source methods. And it, it's a well-educated electorate is, is necessary for the Republic, as Thomas Jefferson once said, and that is still true. So there's the deep underlying structure of why the old fart RJ in his den in Spokane, Washington, uh, keeps hammering away on reference notes and source citations. This is part of a bigger worldview approach to how do you decide what's true? And if people who have a method that can allow them to believe things that aren't true can get into positions of power and make decisions for you that's going to affect your life and your kids' lives, and in some cases where you can live and what you can do and your experience of things, it matters. And so we all have to get off our duff and proceed that. Was that a charming box, uh, soapbox to stand on, uh, Jackson? I think so. I think <laughs> you did quite well. Yeah, yeah. And so it's more than just that. Um, it's not about um, um, any political party or any religious or lack of it perspective or, or the, whatever. It's about how do you figure out what's real and true and how do you stand up for what it is and make sure that people in governance uh, have brains that are in gear. Uh, we can't afford scientific illiterates and historical illiterates in government anymore. We never could. But, but the, the extent to which we've got a, a, a glut of them uh, in positions of power is just unacceptable. We can't survive as a, a functioning republic if we have nincompoops who um, uh, think the earth is 6,000 years old or think climate science is a hoax um, uh, to deal with that. Uh, I just, the Chinese invented climate science. Yes, they did that. Um, the I uh, just happened to be discussing earlier, there was a, um, a posting that I discovered about uh, a fellow who happens to be the husband of uh, Megan McCain, who is on The View, and she's often getting herself into trouble. She's an anti-Trump Republican, but she also is very politically conservative. And her husband, I hadn't really heard about him at all, but it turns out he founded the Federalist website, which I had a bunch of stuff in my tip reference base from climate science denialism. And it turns out he was knee deep in the Heartland Institute, which is fossil fuel covered. It, he's also an anti-evolutionist. Uh, and uh, so the same bad method 
that he applies to climate science and evolution, uh, you think he's not applying that to politics? He was on a homophobic rant against Seth Meyers for his interview with his uh, a wife uh, that was just on the uh, uh, show last night. And uh, then he retreated and retracted stuff. In fact, he turns out this guy has been rather fond of removing signs of his prior stupid. Uh, so an awful lot of his earlier posts, uh, like on anti-evolution stuff, have just disappeared. He doesn't have on his website anymore. Uh, he's been fired from various positions. The Washington Post sacked him because he was misrepresenting sources. Uh, uh, the National Review uh, found that he was plagiarist. Uh, you know, it's terrible. This is bad method 101. And yet this fellow and his wife is are having a, um, a position on the public stage in a way that their method doesn't justify. Nobody should be listening to these people because they're they're methodologically incompetent. Yeah, that's true. Such as yeah, imagine, imagine a standard where we have presidents that read and, <laughs> and and ones that that try to pay attention to both sides of a data field and reach careful judgments based upon reading all sides of an issue. And then if somebody has their head up their ass, isn't a coward and refuses to say that, no, they'll actually say sorry. But some issues don't have two sides. If one side is preposterously stupid like the, we didn't land on the moon or the vaccination, vaccination doesn't work. Um, to have an equal time balance between stupid and not stupid is not balanced. And so our media has to be reformed as well. And well, the only people that are going to do it are us. Yeah. yeah jump in, Jeff. I do, I do agree with that. I think uh, part of that mentality comes from when you, when, whenever you watch the news, every time, there is always a panel to discuss everything. There does not have to be a panel to discuss everything. Uh, pe not everyone's opinion on every topic needs to be heard. Yeah. If it, if someone is claiming, uh, you know, Notre Dame was burned by terrorists or whatever or arsonists, no, there's no his opinion does not matter. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a a perfect example of how the media needs to be reformed. I am old enough to remember when a half hour news program had 25 minutes of news. Oh, that's not the case now. And it's degenerated into about 10 minutes of which a chunk of it is clickbait, where we're gonna tell you about the, the, the heart tugging story that you're gonna see at the end of the show. And there may be a, a tiny fragments of information plopping up in there. And it's in a sea of commercials. And I, I have seen that, but there was a, a point on, um, uh, where I think it was uh, Cuomo who was interviewing a New Jersey anti-climate science person, his politician. And they got derailed because he was saying there are lots of scientists uh, uh, are skeptical of uh, climate science. And instead of him asking a methods question, which would have been, oh, can you name them? And how did you determine their qualifications? He goes off, oh, well, why, why don't you agree with the, uh, with the consensus? So that turns it away from source methods to just an opinion piece. And then the guy went further when he was saying, well, it used to be the consensus among science that the earth was flat. Uh, not really. And that too was a misrepresentation of what the history of things were, but you would not know that if you had not actually probed with questions. So source methoding needs to be on the scene all the time, 24 seven. And it, needs to start from the grassroots up. If you think that the pundits up at MSNBC or uh, a Fox News or anywhere else are going to do this all on their own, when they have a market incentive to do twaddle and to do f fist fights between opposites to look good on the ratings, no, they ain't going to do it unless you force them into it. And, and in a source methods environment, you won't have such firefights because source methods are gonna weed out twaddle at the bottom to where you go, well, we, we, this person is completely unqualified and has failed source methods. Um, we don't need to include them in the show at all <laughs> because right. they don't have that. And so you don't, you, the, uh, offering two sides to a position that doesn't have two sides is not accurate. And uh, it's a matter of figuring out, sometimes there are legitimate controversies in science or in, in politics where it is a matter of philosophy. Sure. Um, 
And you, you find this in a lot of areas where the main primary difference between uh, people on abortion issues are philosophical in nature and their relation, well, how they want to think about whether people have souls or not. Uh, but there are science issues that come up as to when a heartbeat starts and does that occur long before there's a nervous system? And so what is the circumstance of that? This is directly playing out in in issues in the new law in Georgia. Uh, so this is... A, state. Yeah, and if you look at... One of the things that led me into this political aspect is that I was looking at the dynamics of anti-evolutionists. And one thing I started noticing really early was that they had a particularly narrow political perspective. Whereas the evolution side, you've got very conservative evolutionists, you have flaming liberal evolutionists, you have religious evolutionists, you have atheist evolutionists. It covers a whole broad spectrum, even though on average, you probably find that they are more liberal than average. Sure. Uh, it's, it's on an average. But in creationism, it's very different. Try finding a non-hyper-conservative anti-evolutionist. Try finding a non-religious anti-evolutionist. You can count them on one hand and have fingers left over. Michael Denton, uh, who's technically an agnostic. And then you've got um, uh, Richard Milton, who's a young earth creationist without being religious. <laughs> and then you've got uh, uh, of David Berlinski. And if anyone can figure out what David Berlinski thinks, let me know. And that's <laughs> it. Three. And the rest are all hyper-conservative religious. Um, that uh, you get an aspect of anti-evolutionism in left-wing politics in the connection about uh, nature versus nurture and whether there are uh, 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 basic characteristics between the sexes. And so that some of that actually pops up in that range, although it doesn't crystallize quite as adamantly as what you find in the culture camp conservative religious frame that's anti-evolutionism. Well, you look at that block and look to see what social policies they advocate and what political candidates they favor. And boy, is it consistent. And so the idea that this methodological problem that relates to creationism isn't spilling over into the political realm, it's been doing it for decades and has gradually been taking over the Republican Party, shrinking it down into the culture camp conservative NRA Trumpista party now. And that's, it. And that's a, a unhealthy for the Republic, for one thing. Um, and you find the Democratic Party flailing around to see how they're going to fill that void. And so their tendency is to move more towards the progressive left. And of course, then you get people tarring people with socialism and all sorts of buzzwords going on. So we live in very tendentious and, and, and um, uh, disturbing times. But at ground, you've got to keep track of what the method is and look at primary sources on every matter. Don't depend on secondary websites. Um, they can be an avenue to an issue, but don't rely on them like an oracle and, and try to find primary source data whenever possible. A lot of government statistics, Trump is in a terrible problem with his own administration in the fact that, that he will make stupid statements that his own departments disagree with. And they have to put out little announcements saying, well, no, that's not actually true. And this is what the data are and all that thing. And uh, the, the information is available. Uh, and it's up to us to do it. And anybody who here is younger than old fart me, it's your future that's going to be screwed up if we don't get this right. Bingo. Maybe. So, yeah. I'm a cockeyed optimist um, um, because we've gone through the Black Death and the Second World War and so many things that have happened that, that, have, that have put us into uh, arrears and we have the tools available uh, the whole point about source methods is the availability of data. And so long as that is not curtailed, so long as uh, people don't, or worse, tunnel vision their own brain by only paying attention to one little side, when somebody will say, well, you should read more creationism, then you'd understand why creationism is so true. And I go, au contraire, it's because I read so much creationism, way more than the typical creationist does, that I know why it's a pile of dingoes kidneys. And so the, uh, the, the I have an advantage in being a retired person that I have a lot of time on my hands to be able to devote a hell of a lot of time to doing this tip project, which is functionally full-time work. Um, and uh, thank you, patrons again. Uh, and uh, GoFundMe people who have helped and everybody who gets my books, little book royalties come in. Uh, that, that helps a lot. But it's 
something that people like Jackson, who is going to college and working his way through, you don't have 24-7 to be able to devote to a lot of these issues. And I'm just gobsmacked at how much effort that you can put, in fact, into that, because I remember how busy I was in college, that that's quite a, a, a juggling act to pull off and have a life outside of that. You have a girlfriend and go out and do things and actually live. Uh, that, that That's a, a, a busy things to uh, deal with. But everybody collectively can play a part by that collective and to rely upon the best information that you have to triage people that, oh gosh, that's a stupid person. And therefore they are unreliable no matter what they say, even if they say the truth, they're unreliable. So better find a better reliable source for these things and connect up with people so that you can exchange information back and forth. So even if you don't know everything, you can connect up with people who collectively know everything. And that's what we have to do. We, we've got the networking, we've got these tools, uh, social media, uh, uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook, and we've got emails and we've got live tubes like this where we can literally do it. The YouTubing, uh, as my uh, nephew-in-law uh, uh, snarked at me for my old terminology on stuff, the YouTubes. Uh, but it's the tools that are there. And, the interwebs. Yeah, interwebs, yes. Uh, and I guarantee you that once you learn the skill set of sound method, it's exhilarating. It, it reinforces your sense of confidence because instead of uh, criticizing people based upon just throwing your prejudice against their prejudice, no, you're grounding on areas that you know well. And so that you can feel confident in your discussion on things and you can ask those little terrible methods questions that shut creationists up like a hurry going, oh, interesting. Do you have sources for that claim? And how did you fact check them? That's what we asked. Uh, what's his name? The guy we talked to from Haiti the other week. Oh, oh, yes, yes. James, I uh, forgot his last name. Yeah, there. James. Yeah, he, uh, he did? really didn't read anything he wouldn't defend creationism to us only intelligent design but he didn't read any intelligent design he would he would talk to us about books he had not read <laughs> so ending michael Behe's darwin's black box to somebody who has read darwin's black box and he hasn't and then i would ask him did you fact check any of the material in that well he has never read the book how could he all these rift off of are lectures that he's seen online and articles he's seen posted by the intelligent designers where Michael Behe tells you how brilliant Michael Behe is. Sorry. I mean, I can say how brilliant RJ Downard is, but unless you start looking at the material uh, and hopefully you will be aware that when you fact check me, just like I fact check you, I don't take your word for anything. I read the material and I go, Oh, that's a good one. Yes, there we go. And that builds you a sense of confidence that's very different than, than a preacher. To be fair, the mindset that he's using, because he's a preacher down in Haiti, that's what religionists do, to where they have the gospel, which they learn about, and it's a book that they believe in, and they may not have read it that closely, and they've heard other people tell them how wonderful it is, and they repeat the tropes they've heard. He applies that same method to the intelligent design. That's methods yeah. again. Uh, yeah. uh, I am very smart. Oh, shucks. I am diligent. That's one thing. I am tenacious. I, I, I have a good, pretty good memory. I remember better when I write things down. So the taking of the notes creates a, a, an external memory frame. Plus, I have my gigantic reference field uh, in the tip thing. So when I go, what was that? What was that? Oh, well, that's how I found out about the Federalist Society connection with that guy. I Googled my word or yeah. not Google, but text searched. And so that pulls up that information frame. And um, uh, Richard Wood said, my source references would be longer than the videos. That's another issue. Yeah. Um, uh, um, here was my little, my little itty bitty uh, evolution slam dunk with its 2,300 sources that took 100 pages to print in the book in small print. <laughs> That's what you can find out about in when you really dive into source material at that level. There's a colossal amount of information. Uh, there was an old line that uh, Martin Gardner, if you remember him from the ancient days, 
He uh, used to do uh, science uh, writing for Scientific American and mathematical puzzles and things. And he did a still classic book that everyone should have in their library, uh, Fad and Fallacies in the Name of Science, that he did back in the 1950s. Has stuff on Velikovsky and, and Hollow Earth and all sorts of wacky stuff and a little bit on creationism, which at that time was looking like a dead as a doornail thing. Uh, little did he know things were going to change. But he once said that if you want to know how little you know about a subject, try writing a book about it. That the kind of thing that would pass for a, a, just a, a video or an article, if you really want to do justice to it, you find out that you may not have known as much about it as you thought you did. And I think Jackson will probably agree with me on this very point, that, 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 that as we're writing this book and diving into it as a book, holy moly, the stuff that we needed to find out and have found out. It's, it's like opening up a door to a giant vista. Yeah, it it takes a while to write uh, some material, but after you've just been sitting there writing for a while, you're like, oh, wow, five pages. Where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, or another area where I'll go, ooh, what an interesting little point. What exactly do the creationists say about pheromones? And when I start investigating that, it opens up a whole cornucopia of material. Uh, Lisa says one thing that's wrong with YECs is that they can't even understand source material. It's not just young earth creationists. That's why I coined that damn Tortukan word. So use this on social media. Make it trending. Can't anything ever trend? Uh, the uh, um, uh, okay, spell that out. Tortukan alert. Tortukans are people who don't think about things they don't want to think about. And they easily confuse primary and secondary sources. That somebody telling them what Charles Darwin said about the eyeball makes them think they understand what Charles Darwin said about the eyeball without ever actually reading anything about it or studying it. And so the, the ability to confuse primary and secondary sources is, is effortless in anti-evolutionism. You, you and I have both encountered this. Mike Riddle citing source material that to this day he hasn't read. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Yeah, and uh, this this is not atypical. This is common. 95% oh. of anti-evolutionists don't cite primary sources. I thought it was um kind of funny how uh when, when we were looking at inspiring philosophy's video on structuralism, he had too many sources to put in the description, so he had to devote a blog post to all of his sources. Turns out his sources really didn't support his argument at all. So oh. So that's why I, um, uh, I, um, I know that if you can be deluged with source material on Twitter or Facebook. Like so I, I'm more parsimonious in that. And the same thing with the, with the YouTube videos. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Jackson, you're a worse offender than I am for having a huge number of technical sources that you'll be listing. In uh, complaints. Uh, Nonetheless, yes, I bow to you, sir. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I, if, if I say something in a sentence uh, and I got it from some paper, then I got to put it in the sources. The worst I ever did was the, the paleontology video. I used so many sources in that video. I actually had to, I pinned the top comment and put the rest of my sources. That's yeah, how yeah, it was. It, 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 it limitations as to some of their spaces to what you can fiddle fart on that. But when you get to print form, uh, or more of, of, of formal papers, there ain't no excuse for not having a rigorous amount of sources. And uh, 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 given the fact that nowadays word processor documents can be of unlimited length for all practical purposes, and you can have, it's so easy to be able to do the referencing and the, and the typing and all of that in there. You don't have to worry about using whiteout and you have the carbon paper and all of that. I'm from the ancient days of typewriters, that irony of seeing the typewriters on the opening logo and all of that. The ability to handle, to have on your desk a functioning print shop that can do perfectly legible material and store it electronically and and send it anywhere in the world as a PDF or as a doc file. This is a miracle, kids. Do you realize the tools you have at your disposal? Use them. We're and the PDFs, you know, that um, uh, part of the fun in tracking down source material is finding out what the original text said. And so there was a, just an example I had to go out to Eastern about where uh, creationists that were going to be lamb basting in uh, rocks were there, had made the mistake of, of uh, referring to a 1953 book by Julian Huxley. Oh, yeah. Evolution, popular yep. book. And it turns out Eastern had it in their stacks. 
And so I go out there and this helpful little fellow trails me back into the nether regions where the Q section was in the stacks. And we find the book like that. And we go down and I didn't even know about this until it was explained to me. There's a free to the public PDF scanner system. So I can make the copies of that image of the pages at no cost, generate a PDF and email it to myself. So huh. I didn't have to go through the rigmarole of, of making a physical hand uh, uh, um, copy of uh, money. It's free, open to anybody. They're in the, in the little Carol section there of their, of their library. That's the 21st century, man. So there I had the, so when I got home from there, I opened up the PDF from the email and then I, I, I printed up a section of it uh, that I was relevant to the point at issue of where what Huxley was talking about, um, this guy was riffing off of his thing where he was talking about the evolution of the horse. And Huxley said there should be about a million um, mutations and that the odds against this happening were 10 to the 300 millionth to one. And it was this preposterous number. And what he was talking about was to go from a bacterium to a horse in one go. So that would be how many mutations you might need to do that. But he said, of course, this is preposterous. That's not how evolution works. It's a mutation that then gets fixated by natural selection. And then another one gets built onto that and another one built onto that mutation after mutation, mutation. And that that's how it actually works. Either the guy didn't read the whole text or he was suppressing that explanation because he, and so I'm actually quoting the part where he says that not only can natural selection do this, we observe it doing it. <laughs> it can fixate a mutation in a, a few iterations because of the way natural selection works. And we don't have to guess that, we can observe it. But they want, the creationist wants you to go from a bacterium to a horse right in front of you in one gigantic go, not over hundreds of millions of years from bacterium to multicellular organisms, to the precursor of chordates, to early chordates, to uh, the early uh, um, uh, tetrapods, and uh, and then finally to synapsids up on the land, and then synapsids through therapsids and into mammals, and then from mammals down to parasodactyls and into the horses. That's a lot of steps. And we can see step by step by step by step by step and look at the mutations that are involved in that. And the ones looking at the mutations are the actual scientists. Poor Huxley, it was unconscionably manipulative to use a 1953 quote from Huxley, not even quote, an illusion. What's famous about the year 1953 for biology? Is that the year the structure of DNA was discovered? So here is somebody writing a book that comes out in the year that the very first time somebody says DNA is the mechanism of inheritance, but they don't yet know how, that it was another 10 years before they started figuring out the codons, and it was decades more before they could start doing full genomes of ATCGs, bum, 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 bum. And then only in the 1990s are they discovering homeobox genes and all of these other regulatory systems that, that it's stupid to think that something that Huxley tossed off in a popular book could be relevant to somebody doing an article in 2009 when you should have had access to all of that bloody information. And all because Eastern had the hard copy of the book. <laughs> yeah, that's and to, to PDF free. Is that the same book that was quote mined by a bit of orange regarding a uh, how mutations happen. I wonder if that was the same one. I look, I, when I did a Google search for this particular bit, uh, he, th uh, this article that I'm criticizing, uh, was literally the only one that did it online. So I think that although Huxley may have been riffed off of in other contexts, this particular factoid, uh, seems to have been, uh, pretty much his doing. And uh, so he probably got it from somewhere. Uh, Brooke asks, uh, how do you know, where do you there, how do you know that animal uh, uh, has uh, kids to transition? He's uh, referring to Kent Hovind. Kent Hovind is my uh, exemplar of what not to do in the way of source methods, that he is everything you could uh, possibly do wrong. What was the title of the book by by Huxley? Oh, uh, oh gosh, uh, yipes. It wasn't uh, Evolution in Action, was it? Oh, yeah, I'd have to look up the, the damn bibliography on it. Um, it's, um, it, it's something like, 
it's not exploring evolution or adventure in evolution or something like that from 1953. And it was a problem because although um, it was um, an older work, it, nobody had scanned it. It wasn't available online. Some works are, in fact, like all virtually all of Heckel's material is available in PDF scans now. And, and most of, of Thomas Huxley's uh, books and that uh, popular books that he did in the 1890s are actually available on the Project Gutenberg. It's neat. Uh, to be able to have the original material. There's an awful lot scanned, but this little book wasn't one of them. So I just was like a kid in a, scan a candy store uh, when uh, I discovered that EWU... Uh, it, uh, it might be... We might be thinking about the same book because a bit of orange riffed off of it. Uh, Actually, few works, and so several of them have been riffed off of. He, yes. he, in most scientists tend to do in their older age, they start writing popularizations. Um, well, uh, the one, a bit of orange was talking about it because he, because in this section of a book, which was by Huxley in the year 1953 titled, uh, evolution in action, he was talking about how harmful, uh, uh, mutations caused by, uh, radioactive, like radioactive, uh, things that cause mutations, how yeah. these are harmful to an organism. But a bit of orange took that, which he probably copied from someone else, because I doubt he found the original book. Referring to Haldane, that was this was uh, Julian Huxley. Oh, okay. And I found I found the uh, he gets because of the dilemma. He gets quote mined a lot. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, I remember him, but relatively um, a oddly peripheral player. He was probably way better known in 1970 than anybody would think about him now. He's just, you know, one of the Huxley grandkids knocking around. Oh, um, uh, Puffalophagus says, uh, uh, can we do an hour on climate change sometime? I would be delighted. Yeah, actually be fun to go. Uh, if you uh, have a show on that one, um, uh, I'd be happy to be a guest on that one. Uh, or, or we can do a thing here on it because it, it bumps over into that. There's no coincidence that the National Center for Science Education started tracking climate science denialism because a lot of the same demographic that showed up in anti-evolutionism are actually spilling over into uh, climate science denialism and using exactly the same methods. In fact, you're much more likely in the current environment to bump into a climate science denialist than an anti-evolutionist. Or if, even if they are an anti-evolutionist, they don't make a big deal out of it. Uh, so, uh, but they do make a big deal out of uh, climate accords, and and you know we don't want to have the least taxes on things. Uh, and uh, if you start scraping to see what sources they're drawing on, and Coulter would be a trifecta uh, because she would be a climate scientist uh, de a denying anti-evolutionist and political harpy, uh, all <laughs> in one um, uh, disagreeable package, and is a poster child of bad methods again. So everything can be perceived as a methods issue. And how you can look up what the, the background material is. There's a lot of websiders on uh, these matters and uh, uh, lots that are done by actual climate scientists. And uh, then, of course, the climate science technical literature uh, is so readily available. Uh, any of it that appears in, in uh, PNAS uh, will be uh, open access. And most of the science papers will be ending up in college websites and that open access or on... Um, uh, academia edu or research gate so the accessibility of it there you got to learn the jargon just like you would in with the geology texts or anything else but it's not magic and you can google terms and find out what the context of things are and uh, once you get to figure out what the he secret handshakes are then you too can play on the field it's not we magic should probably i don't know if i've written it down in the notes but we should probably allude to it at some point in creationism land maybe with regard to the uh chapter on the plasticine the ice age probably be a good place to write about it be an excellent spot to slip it in because the it it's a, a culture camp issue that needs to be reminded that there is a crossover between that anti-evolutionism bad method and the climate science politicization bad method if you look at somebody like uh, inhofa uh, the senator, uh, the one that brought the snowball into the Senate and, and, and said, see, this proves global warming isn't happening. Uh, that guy has relied 100% on secondary material. Somebody like Dinesh D'Souza, who uh, complains about climate science once in a while, he, he, he's sort of okay with evolution. Uh, but uh, as you know, because we've had discussions about uh, Dinesh, mm -hmm. uh, 
he's a, an incompetent in so many areas, and he's a historical revisionist too. Exactly the same bad method. That once you start looking at the primary sources, you find out what he's data selecting and also what data he's ignoring, or maybe doesn't even realize he's ignoring um, because he doesn't bother to look, or in some instances that he must be ignoring unless he's blind as a bat because it was in the goddamn source he just cited. So uh, you get all of those range, and you find that with um, uh, that, that oddly enough, somebody like Kent Hovind is operating at a pure bottom feeder level, whereas Dinesh D'Souza is at a higher level of very um, politicized semi-bottom feeding because he actually does riff off of some uh, scholarly material that I suspect he's probably read on his own. But that opens up a completely new can of worms because if you cite the source and it contains information that contradicts your point of view and you never mentioned it, bad dog. So that, that there's your source methods again. Well, we've spilled all way past the hour on that. Oh, Pavlovicus, I love when James curses. Yes, yes, yes. That's uh, uh, Darny Fudge. Uh, I am perfectly capable of, of using more profanity in there, but I, I try to really skewer people with a polite but unanswerable questions for them. Uh, that they, 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 uh, uh, that 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 is far worse, and it shuts them up. But they get, because the typical creationist or ideologue can handle insult easily. You call them names, and they'll just name call back. Uh, but you uh, say, "Excuse me, how are you coming with that? Those therapsids? I've been waiting for you to discuss probiotic methods. You know, anytime you want, come on in, please. Or that article that you cited and you didn't want to read. Shall we discuss it again? Uh, shall we discuss it with the person who wrote the article? Um, and you won't get responses on any of that stuff because that's um, uh, there. Uh, I, um, Richard says boycott soap opera media. There, fixed it. Um, I'm. Uh, I don't say necessarily boycott because it can be a useful venue to observe what's going on in the Vox Populi. But what grassroots people and activists need to do is to infect everybody with the source methods virus which is to demand that they offer primary source material or shut up uh that um to prod reporters more contact your local reporters and things and, and tell them about how they need to beef up their game on that or write a letter to the editor or whatever needs you know or follow them on social media or whatever uh just as uh, uh with videos uh, urge people to offer primary source uh, linkages at least some uh, so that they can, uh, anybody can do follow up and make it the standard that you do follow up. Because if you're afraid for people to do follow up on your arguments, then you are not somebody that's reliable. Uh, you're just an ideologue, and and I don't want anybody to regard me as just the fantastically clever pundit in Spokane. Uh, no, that I I uh, I play fair with the facts. I want everybody to follow up on things once in a while. I make goof up mistakes. Everybody can make gum up to, uh, once in a while, uh, and and to to err is human, but to correct requires sound method. That was a line that I put in one of my books uh, in the, up on the website, and I stick by that. So source methods forever, source methods or bust and uh, and use politeness and the science and technical material that's available. We, we, we got so many tools. Oh, I've been told <laughs> I've been told by by uh, people that I'm often too polite with the creationists I bring on. Interestingly enough, when Dean Esme was watching a video that I was a part of a collaboration he said I was the only one who didn't ask a stupid question. I was like, I can't make anyone angry. I can't even make Dean Esme angry. <laughs> well, you are pleasant, and you, you are, you are uh, firm in uh, your criticisms and the like. But yeah, you, uh, I can be a little testy. And of course, with somebody like Nephilim, I can actually lose my temper. Well, uh, but then again, if you can't lose your temper around Nephilim, where can you lose your temper? I, because he's such a... a you know, Bill Ludlow just had a talk with him, and I watched a little bit of that, and it was infuriating. Uh, Bill Ludlow wiped the floor with him, of course, because Nephilim's Nephilim. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I did get upset when I had my talk with Sylvester Williams on the Non Sequitur show. He made me upset because he was very disingenuous. So, I made me upset. Yeah, part of the matter, the, some of the ones that I've been seeing um, in some of uh, modern day debates uh, material is where it looks like. The, that the the structure of the debate got changed before the debater showed up. 
so that you have the creationist debating somebody on a topic that they actually hadn't prepared for and that this was kind of last minute stuff. There's a certain amount of squidgy little fog, fog bank on things. I like to be really precise about uh, what we're going to be talking about. I'm not terribly frustrated at the range because I think I'm pretty well covered on most everything. So I can let them pick their subject matter. In fact, there's there's a certain logic to letting them pick the topic because they're probably going to pick their, their what they think is their strong suit. And if you pull the rug out from under their strong suit, where do they have a fallback? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, I think we've done that to death. Or if they have uh, no strong suit in the first place. <laughs> we can, we can uh, curtail the show for today. Uh, they, uh, thank you very much for showing up on there. We've uh, uh, continued to uh, venture into the exciting world of, of uh, source methods. It's it's fun stuff to do. I love the, uh, I, uh, for sometimes scraping along financially, but I enjoy what I'm doing. And I think I'm doing really interesting, useful material. And I think you do the same thing from your end. And Pelogia and have these various others are all in that. Bye, insects. So we'll, we'll uh, stop our broadcast today and we will be seeing you next week. About the only time when we'll have a little hiatus will be um, uh, um, uh, possibly in July when I won't be around to be able to do some things uh, later on in that month, but that's we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Anyway, keep passing the word on tip. Tell them that I do lecture uh, and I'm perfectly capable of debating and uh, I am um, uh, open accessible for all sorts of things. I'm not shy. Okay, see you next week. <laughs>